there is an invisible boundary on every electronic warfare chart known as the burn-through range. It is the physical limit where your jamming stops working. Cross it, and your electronic cloak evaporates. Cross it, and the enemy radar sees you naked. Cross it, and you die. But at 0200 hours on January 3rd, the USS Iwo Jima didn't just touch this line. She parked 50 miles inside it, 80 miles offshore. Emissions dark, 3,000 souls aboard. To a civilian news crew, this looks like a standard deployment. To a naval war planner, this looks like a floating coffin. Why position a $3 billion asset where a single button press can turn it into an artificial reef? Why place a level two trauma center where the doctors are statistically likely to become the casualties? The answer lies in a paradox that defies conventional military logic. We are not here to show you a sitting duck. We are here to show you a trap. Today on Navy Decoded, we deconstruct the calculus of the 80 mile gamble. We are about to prove why the most dangerous place on the map is actually the safest. Welcome to the briefing. Let's run the numbers. At 80 nautical miles, the Iwo Jima is a sitting duck, the S-300 VM surface to air missile system. NATO designation, Ante 2500. Maximum engagement range, 135 nautical miles. Do the math, 135 miles of lethality, minus 80 miles of position, equals 55 miles deep inside the kill box. One button press, two minutes of flight time. $3 billion becomes an artificial reef. But look closer at the shadow beside at her. Arlie Burke, Flight 3 Destroyer. On the superstructure, the AN Spy 6 Air and Missile Defense Radar. 37 independent radar modular assemblies. Each one a self contained transmit receive node. But here's the physics breakthrough that changes everything gallium nitride, GAN a semiconductor material that operates at voltages 30 times higher than the old silicon-based SPY-1 radar. This isn't an incremental upgrade. This is a quantum leap in electromagnetic power. The SPY-6 doesn't just see farther. It sees through weather, through chaff, through jamming. It tracks a golf ball in flight from 200 miles while simultaneously monitoring 300 other contacts. It doesn't just detect. It paints the target, classifies the signature, generates a firing solution before the enemy missile clears the rail. Inside the Combat Information Center, the Venezuelan coast appears as a grid of green contacts. Each dot, a potential threat, radar installations, missile batteries, early warning stations. The destroyer isn't playing defense, she's playing offense. If a Venezuelan S-300 battery activates its engagement radar, the fire control computer doesn't wait. It fires first. SM-6 interceptors. $4.3 million each. Mission, not to strike the radar site. Mission, kill the inbound threat while it's climbing through 30,000 feet at Mach 5. But the SM-6 has a capability that separates it from every interceptor that came before. An active radar seeker. In the terminal phase, it doesn't need guidance from the mother ship. It hunts autonomously. Target tries to maneuver, the missile recalculates. Target deploys decoys, the seeker discriminates. The SM-6 doesn't chase, it predicts, it closes geometry. Two missiles, head-on intercept, combined closure rate, Mach 10. Let's talk about the physics of this collision. The SM-6 doesn't carry a large warhead, it doesn't need one. At that speed, Newton's laws take over. The impact strikes with the physics of a meteorite. The kinetic energy is so intense that upon contact, steel doesn't just bend or break. It undergoes instantaneous phase change. It turns from solid metal directly into superheated plasma. The target doesn't explode. It vaporizes. This is hit-to-kill technology. We don't use explosives. We use mathematics to weaponize velocity. Pure kinetic energy transformed into total destruction at the point of contact. Both missiles cease to exist in a fireball. But firing that missile wasn't free. It cost everything. 50 miles away, beneath the surface, the USS Indiana, 
Virginia Class Block 3 Nuclear Attack Submarine. 72 hours on station. Silent running. Virginia payload tubes flooded. Not the old vertical launch system. The VPT configuration. 12 massive tubes built into the hull, each one capable of launching up to seven Tomahawk land attack missiles. GPS coordinates pre-programmed. Every S-300 battery, every command bunker, every radar installation within 200 miles. The moment that enemy radar goes active, the submarine receives the signal via satellite data link. Fire control calculates flight time, 14 minutes. The order was authorized 48 hours ago, tubes open. Tomahawks launch. This is layered deterrence. The destroyer is the shield. The submarine is the hammer. The message is mathematically unambiguous. You fire one missile. We fire 20. Your coastal defense network ceases to exist in 14 minutes. But the real threat isn't the missile. It's the radar that guides it. Theoretically, at 80 miles, enemy radar should already have a stable lock, but it sees nothing. 30,000 feet above the Caribbean, an EA-18G Growler, racetrack pattern, six hours on station. It's not jamming. That's 1980s technology. This is 2026. We don't block the signal. We rewrite it. Digital radio frequency memory, DRFM, Photoshop for radar. When enemy radar pulse hits the aircraft, it captures the waveform, digitizes it, analyzes modulation patterns, transmits back a modified signal. A lie. The technique? Range gate pull-off. Venezuelan radar sees the ship at 80 miles. One second later, the false return makes the target appear at 82 miles, then 90 miles. The fire control system tries to track, but the target keeps drifting away. It can't generate a stable lock because the target won't hold still. The real ship never moved, still stationary at 80 nautical miles. But the enemy radar is chasing a ghost heading toward Jamaica. We're not hiding the ship. We're making the enemy waste missile fuel on phantoms. But electronic warfare isn't just about fooling radar. It's about severing the neural pathways. Operating parallel to the Growler, the F-35 is executing a classified mission, cyber injection. The ANAPG-81 radar on the F-35 doesn't just scan terrain. It functions as a high-power broadcast antenna. It can transmit a malware data stream directly into the receiving antenna of the enemy air defense system. Instead of jamming from the outside, it infiltrates the operating system from within. The radar operator's screen doesn't go dark. It still displays a clear blue sky, normal operations. Green status indicators across the board. But in reality, the guidance protocols have been overwritten. The missiles remain on their launch rails. But their electronic brains are dead. The system appears functional. But the kill chain has been severed at the software level. The enemy doesn't know they're blind until they try to fire. Who's conducting this symphony? the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, the battlefield conductor. It renders the battle space in three dimensions. Real time, every radar contact, every friendly position, every threat, fused to see fused into a single tactical picture. The helicopter pilot flying 200 feet above the water in total darkness isn't navigating by instruments alone. The E-2D transmits a God's eye view directly onto his helmet visor. He sees the coastline, the buildings, hostile forces in red, friendlies in green, updated every 1.2 seconds. The United States doesn't just control the ocean. We control the enemy's perception of reality. Why risk 3,000 sailors and a $3 billion ship at near suicidal range? Two machines, the F-35B and the operating room. First, velocity. The USS Iwo Jima is not an airport. It is an instantaneous launch pad. With a flight deck measuring 843 feet, it turns aviation rules into exceptions. Thanks to STOVL technology, short takeoff and vertical landing, the F-35B requires a runway run of a mere 600 feet to achieve perfect lift. 
While supercarriers burn minutes turning into the wind to charge catapults, the Iwo Jima's fighter tears into the sky in a single breath. It completely erases the concept of dead time. But how does a 20-ton fighter defy gravity in such a short distance? It relies on a mechanical miracle hidden behind the cockpit. When the pilot engages the system, a clutch locks into place. It transfers 29,000 horsepower, equivalent to the entire propulsion plant of a guided missile frigate, from the main turbine to the lift fan, in a heartbeat. Let's look deeper at this mechanical marvel. The drive shaft, connecting the engine to the lift fan, is constructed from carbon composite material. It must withstand maximum torque without twisting even one millimeter. If this shaft deflects by 0.1 degrees, the aircraft will tear itself apart in mid-air. And the clutch? It doesn't use metal friction plates. It uses carbon-carbon discs capable of withstanding 3,000 degrees Celsius. The same material used for space shuttle re-entry brakes. The entire transition from horizontal to vertical flight occurs autonomously. The flight control computer makes 40,000 micro-adjustments per second to maintain balance on a massive column of compressed air. The pilot doesn't fly the aircraft. He commands it. The algorithms execute. Vertical thrust, 40,000 pounds. It doesn't taxi, it lifts. From 80 miles, it's over the hostile capital in 11 minutes. Do the math. Ford, 15 minutes launch prep plus 28 minutes flight time equals 43 minutes total. Iwo Jima, three minutes launch prep plus 11 minutes flight time equals 14 minutes total. That 29 minute difference isn't tactical advantage. It's the boundary between survival and casualty. Second, blood. A Marine takes a round to the femoral artery. He has exactly 60 minutes before exsanguination. Not 61, not 59, exactly 60, the golden hour. Physiological countdown. After 60 minutes without surgical intervention, survival rate drops from 98% to below 40%. One hour is the difference between a handshake and a funeral. The MV-22 Osprey. Cruise speed, 240 knots, four nautical miles per minute. Subtract ground time under fire, 15 minutes. Subtract movement from flight deck to operating room, 10 minutes. Fixed overhead, 25 minutes. Subtract from the 60 minute golden hour. You have 35 minutes left for flight at four miles per minute maximum distance, 140 nautical miles. But combat is chaos, evasive maneuvers, weather delays. You need margin for error. The safe operating distance isn't 140 miles, it's 80 miles. That's the number that guarantees the golden hour is preserved. That's why the ship must be positioned exactly where enemy missiles can reach her. The Ford, one operating room. The Iwo Jima, six operating rooms. 15 ICU beds, 600 surge capacity beds. In mass casualty scenarios, the Iwo Jima activates surge protocols. 600 patient beds, a full theater hospital, materialized in hours. The Navy doesn't position the ship at 80 miles to kill the enemy. We position her there to save our own. When the sky collapses, when a helicopter takes fire and goes down, that is when the USS Iwo Jima executes a maneuver the $13 billion supercarrier cannot perform. It manipulates Archimedes' principle. Deep within the hull, massive ballast pumps engage. The 40,000-ton vessel deliberately sinks her own stern. She inhales thousands of tons of seawater into ballast tanks, lowering her center of gravity until the boundary between ship and ocean is erased. A 266-foot well deck transforms into an internal harbor. This isn't a cargo hold. It is a miniature naval base contained within a ship. From the belly of this monster, shadows emerge. SWCC teams. Combatant craft assault boats. Carbon composite hulls. Sprint speeds exceeding 50 knots. They launch from the mothership's womb, gliding into the darkness. No wake, no radar signature. By the time enemy coastal radar hunts for them, they are already engines off, 
drifting into the extraction point 500 meters offshore. But the Iwo Jima isn't just about finesse, it's about brutality. What if the special operations team is critical and trapped deep inland? What if sea states render speedboats useless? The mothership plays her final card, the LCAC landing craft, Air Cushion. This isn't a boat. It is an aircraft flying on a cushion of air. Four massive gas turbine engines propel this 180-ton beast across the waves at 40 knots. It doesn't stop at the water's edge. It climbs the beach. It traverses swamps. It penetrates five miles inland to recover casualties. This is why the Iwo Jima is invaluable. Carriers only dominate the sky. The Iwo Jima is an amphibious hybrid. She can perform brain surgery on the upper deck, launch stealth fighters from the flight deck, and deploy armored vehicles from the well deck simultaneously. When the LCAC roars back to the mothership, carrying the wounded, it disappears inside the hull. The massive steel gate seals. Ballast pumps purge the water. The ship rises. Every trace vanishes. No one gets left behind. How does the United States Navy position a $3 billion hospital inside the kill zone? Not luck. System architecture, the Ford at 380 miles. The shield, drawing attention, projecting power. The destroyer, the bodyguard, finger on the trigger. Spy-6 radar, painting the battle space with gallium nitride precision. The submarine, the hammer. Virginia payload tubes loaded, waiting. The growler, the magician. Rewriting enemy reality with DRFM deception. The F-35, the ghost. Injecting malware into enemy networks while invisible. And the Iwo Jima at 80 miles the only ship that actually matters. Because when the wounded Marine wakes up in a hospital bed 72 hours later, it's because someone did the math. And that math said 80 miles, not 79, not 81, exactly 80. But behind every number is a human being, the Navy surgeon who hasn't slept in 36 hours. The F-35B pilot sitting in a 120 degree cockpit for six straight hours trusting carbon-carbon friction disks to transition him from death to life. The Growler electronic warfare officer flying racetrack patterns until his spine screams. The submarine sonar operator listening in total silence for 72 hours, waiting for permission to fire. And the 19-year-old radar operator on the Arleigh Burke destroyer, watching gallium nitride modules paint threats on his screen he doesn't know he just participated in a historic operation. He's a kid from Ohio who enlisted because college was too expensive. But his job tonight, tracking threats, feeding firing solutions, keeping the Iwo Jima safe, was the difference between 10 Marines coming home and 10 families receiving folded flags. American military power doesn't come from billion dollar ships. It comes from 19 year olds executing geometry problems perfectly under pressure. The United States doesn't need to invade your capital. We can extract what we need while our hospital ship sits 80 miles offshore, protected by physics, mathematics, and sailors who refuse to accept the word impossible. This isn't a threat. This is a geometry demonstration. The math has been done. The watch is set.